You know, but before I do, we're going to have a word of prayer. Loving Lord, once again, we pause for just a moment. We have a little window here <coughs> that um, we want to open up the scriptures and um, see what you have to say to us. And um, we know who the author is. So we ask that the author, the Holy Spirit, would speak to our heart what it is that we're supposed to know. Also, what it is we're supposed to apply to our lives. Because you have a plan. You have the path that we are supposed to be on. You have things laid out for us, Lord, that you want us to get it. You want us to join you. You want us to follow you. You want us to trust you. So we ask for your presence. Speak to our heart. Woo us, draw us to Jesus. For we ask this in his name. Amen. <coughs> yeah, I changed. I'm sorry. Um, I actually went through several different changes. And I think even one as I'm sitting here. So the closing hymn is whatever you had worked with, that's, that's fine. I, I heard a sermon this week um, on a DVD, uh, actually on a CD, and I thought it was really interesting. And I'm going to try to take this thought and uh, that I got from the sermon and implicate it into what, <laughs> what the Lord had given to me earlier. So hopefully it'll fit. Um, the name of the sermon was How to Be Miserable. 100% guaranteed. And um, I, I wish I'd have heard it more than one time because there was a lot of really interesting things. I'm going to go through very briefly how he begins. How to be miserable. Guaranteed, one of the ways you really want has set your heart on being miserable is get bored. Don't get involved. Just stay bored. The other one is don't forgive people. Hang on to that resentment. Work with that bitterness and allow it to grow. Make little things bother you. Don't just let them um, around, but find for yourself a good worry. Something you can't do anything about and manage that. Don't trust people. Be suspicious. Never accept them for other than their worst and their weakest part. After all, they may have hidden motives. Always compare yourself unfavorably with others. If you really want to be miserable, compare yourself unfavorably with others. Add ego and anger. Take personal insults for everything that happens to you. Another way to really be miserable, guaranteed, is remember every little wrong that has been done to you. Put it in a bag, maybe a barrel, however big it needs to be. Carry it with you, drag it behind you, whatever it, whatever it takes. Another way guaranteed to be miserable is walk by sight and not by faith. I thought that was really interesting. I like that. Don't study the Bible. Be ungrateful. Eliminate distinction from your worldview. I'd like to really explore that one a little bit more sometime, but I'm, I'm not going to take the time to do that this morning. And follow false Christ. How many of us here want to be miserable? How many of us here follow or practice any of these ways that we can be miserable? Don't raise your hand. It was one of those nightmares that you would hope at any moment you were going to wake up from, but you don't. And really, when you think it could get, couldn't get could get any worse, it does. That day came like any other day. There seemed to be no evidence that any trouble was brewing. Of course, when trouble is brewing and it catches you off guard, you never do see it come anyways. 
And all of a sudden, it was like, well, like Harold, when he just fell down, it just poofs and tragedy strikes, catches us unaware. That's what happened this day. There was always a danger that these nomadic bands of guerrilla fighters would attack. But the person that they attacked wasn't too concerned at the time. He figured he could protect himself, but this day was different. They did attack with full force. And what they didn't destroy the first time, what one employer called, or the employee called, the fire of God fell from heaven, did. And no sooner had he received this news that he again received news that another band of guerrilla fighters invaded and raided and destroyed and killed the rest of his employers, employees and his livestock. And before he could take another breath, and when he thought it couldn't get worse, by the way, we know better than to think that way, right? He was told that all ten of his children were killed by what's called a haboob, which is a, stra- a strong desert wind. It had come suddenly when his kids were, well, when they were partying. Job had always prayed for his kids. And he might have been comforted had he the assurance of their salvation. But he had no assurance. By all outward appearances, they had no interest in spiritual matters. It had to be the worst news. It had to be hard enough to face that loss. But how do you face it with no assurance of salvation? He was devastated. And by the time that the devil had got through with him, he could not say, well, at least I have my health. 1,800 years B.C. and roughly a few hundred years later, after Job lived, another man lived. His Egyptian name that was given to him was zaphnath Paneah. Unjustly hated to death by his brothers, they sold him as a slave to be a slave. At 17 years of age, he was removed from all that he knew, all that he loved, many hundreds of miles. Falsely accused, thrown into prison, Joseph endured many trials, and many hardships. Job, Joseph, two of the main, uh, two of the many biblical examples, extreme, of extreme life circumstances. What I think is unique is not that the trials is unique as what they were, but their attitudes and their response to them when they came. Job's physical response was he tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground. Do you know the next two words? His spiritual response and worshiped. His verbal response was, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Joseph's response can be found in Genesis chapter 45. His was, his was, for God sent me before you to preserve life. You meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to save many people. Genesis 45, verse 5. But now he's telling his his brothers, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God has sent me before you to preserve lives. How is it that people can come to these conclusions (laughs) after experiencing such tragedy? You know, we could think so many, uh, some in, in, in our time, Joni Erickson, 
Corey Ten Boom. We can con if we contrast these names who faced what seems to be unsurmountable pain and tragedy with someone that we each or may know who have left God for things like, I wanted green carpet in the church. Someone has sat in my seat. I didn't get my way. They weren't listening to me. Someone didn't greet me Sabbath morning. No smile. And the list goes on. What makes some leave God, I'm sorry, what makes some never leave God under any condition and others leave under any reason? And why do we let what we see in other people affect our walk with Christ and our standing with the church? How is it that some endure through tragedy and others fall at trivial issues? Apostle Paul another, has another experience that's worth noting, I think. In stripes, he says, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In death, often. From the Jews, five times he received 40 stripes minus one, three times beaten with rods, stoned once, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day in a deep in journeys often, in perils of water, robbers of his own countrymen, of Gentiles, cities, wilderness, sea, among false brothers, weariness and toil, and sleeplessness, hunger and thirst, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things that came upon him daily. Do you know how that text follows up again after all that? It follows up with these words, my deep concern for all the churches. That blows me away. He said he would rather boast in his infirmities than that the power of God may be rested upon him. That was his confession in the very next chapter after he gave that whole list of things that he experienced. Paul also said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. My personal feelings, I believe that's the answer to the question. How do you endure? How do you overcome? How do you maintain? How do you stay? It's in knowing Jesus Christ that I can stand regardless of what comes. And it will come. Corey Ten Boom says, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Another key, knowing God. I was um, standing on the beach of Gamble, Alaska, several years ago. Um, Gamble, Alaska, to appreciate that place, you can actually stand on the beach and see Russia. It's roughly 15, 16 miles. <clears throat> um, you can see Siberia, let me put it that way. You can't see, you can see the coastline of Siberia. So it's in the middle, 200 miles off the coast of Alaska, in the middle of the Bering Sea. Two native villages are there. I was standing on the beach with a friend of mine, and he was telling me that he was contemplating Habakkuk 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. Here's what Habakkuk 3, or Habakkuk, how you everyone we want to pronounce it. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, here's what it says. Though the fig tree may, may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. 
And as he was contemplating that, he was wondering if, because they had no olives in Gamble, if he could substitute whale instead. Because his crew had just struck, but it didn't penetrate, so they lost it. And he was claiming this verse for comfort. Someone has said, in Gethsemane, Jesus pleaded desperately for an escape. But he was willing to go to undergo suffering in service to a higher goal. It may not need to be said, but I'll say it anyways. No one has had to suffer as Jesus has. For the joy that was set before him. His strength. His relationship with the Father, his Father. Our strength, same place. Hebrews 12, 12, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we also, since we are so surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily snares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I personally, I would understand that weight is those things that make us miserable, that we hang on to. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. A, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Relationship is possible. And it's needed. I'm not talking about the crutch that we can fall on. It might support us when we need it. God's not something in our minds that we're convinced ourselves that when tragedy strikes, something triggers in us and, and our defense mechanism against hurt and pain kicks in. Knowing God is not a crutch. Knowing God is assurance. Positive. Absolute. Assurance, as we can trust gravity. Joey, when you're up in the tree, you can trust je tra uh, gravity will not fail you. He is our assurance as time keeps moving. There is never a reason to doubt. Now that kind of a relationship with God that we have complete assurance in and confidence in is not always an overnight thing. It begins with understanding his love. Again, as Paul points out, I determined to know any, uh, to know any nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul knew that if the humiliation of Christ could be seen and realized, that if we could comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, that all self-centeredness would be banished from our hearts and we could get a sense of God's great love. And it's thought that a thoughtful hour each day on Calvary will serve to see these things about life from a different perspective, from a proper perspective. Don't get nervous, okay? Let me sing you a song. Turn to Psalms chapter 143. 
Actually, I'm going to go through these sort of fast. Psalms 143, looking at verse 11. Rest, I'm sorry, verse 11, uh, one, get the right. Me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Acts chapter 15, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Hebrews chapter 6. Looking at verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Psalms chapter 18. Verse 18. They comforted me in the day of my calamity. I'm sorry. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Matthew 7. Verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Do you know what song I just sang? Aren't you glad that I didn't sing it? <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, and blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is just sinking sand, right? Another thing to remember is assurance is based on God's word, not on our feelings. We claim strength, help, and victory because his word says so. Not because I feel a certain way. I got to believe that Job felt horrible. But the assurance of his presence is based on his word. It may not feel like he's near, but he is. Another thing for us to remember 
is God isn't bogged down with red tape as FEMA is when disaster strikes. It may seem like he's not responding. We pride ourselves on our quick response teams. We train and retrain. We get all the glitches out. So when the least amount of effort and the most cost effective and the shortest amount of time, we're there. Ready to serve. So in our instant water and fast food lifestyle, it may even seem rude and uncaring when things don't go as fast as we think. God, however, has his timetable because he has far-reaching purposes. Peter says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness. And even though this verse refers to his return, I think it still very much applies to his far-reaching goals for you and I. He does not give us more than we can handle with what he knows that our faith in him can, can, is. It is not a temptation beyond what we are able to securely walk hand in hand with him to bear it and to escape it. Every time we grasp his hand, our faith deepens. We each time trust then more fully in his leading. And God reaches out his hands always, not just in our desperate situations, but in the good and the quiet times. And he says, do you trust me? And his voice becomes more familiar to us when we say yes and take his hand. It will always be the only way of escape is to hold on to his hand. It truly may not seem the easy way, but again, we move by faith and not by sight. It will always be the best way. We can trust him because we know it's safe. Um... I was looking for the time. John 18, verse 36. Oh, yeah, okay, now I know why I got this text here. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. <clears throat> Let me close with this. Um, I have a friend, good friend, who is, <clears throat> prayer request came up, Harold mentioned it, so overwhelmed with this year's election. TV, his wife says, is on constantly. I had a Bible study with him the other day. And... <laughs> When the study was done, I, I said to him, are you okay? Because he was quiet and he was antsy. And um, I looked at it, he was sitting next to his wife, so I looked at her as well, and she's going like this. And uh, I says, you know, what's, what's, what's going on? What's, what's on your mind? He just put his head down, and she says, the election. And the poor guy is so consumed with it, watching it, that probably for the most part of the Bible study, it just went over his head, which is not normal for him. <laughs> Usually he's wrapped up right into it. <clears throat> so we had prayer with him. In fact, I had prayer with him. <laughs> we had prayer with him together as a group when we left, before I left. I, had a, I, I hugged him and had another quick prayer, trying to assure him, you know, this is beyond our control. Don't put it in a bag. Don't carry it with us. Trust God. 
And I, 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 I praise God <clears throat> because, I mean, that's any one of us, right? Getting so wrapped up, so focused, so, uh, so uh, uh, no peripheral vision, just right down to it. And this is, this is what controls my life. This is my whole life. I, I, I've got to watch it. I've got to be part of it. I've got to be, well, I have no control. But that makes me mad. So everything blows up then. And I praise God that, that knowing him, that that doesn't have to be the way life is. That I can truly trust God in all things. I won't like what takes place. Doesn't matter. This isn't home. Jesus said, my God said, this is not my kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. Amen? We can be so thankful for that. So terribly thankful. Joyfully thankful. Any thoughts? Or I'm going to close with prayer.